the Mormon church said that Jesus told them to not drink wine. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. I don't know where, what, I'm sorry, find it because I'm scratching my head thinking, it's not in here. I'm looking for what's in here. You know, if you want to go find the golden plate somewhere, knock yourself out, okay? But it's not in here. That's my concern. What is in this book? This is the roadmap for us as believers. <laughs> So we've started investigating many church traditions, dogmas, and interpretations, which I've been saying the church at large desperately needs reformation. So we are looking for the truth, and one of the truths that we're going to start talking about today, uh, depending on your background and which church you grew up in, or maybe didn't grow up in the church, but people coming to what is commonly called the table of the Lord, communion, Holy Supper, Cup of Blessing, and in other forms of the faith. You see how I did that? Mass. All right? So, boy, some of you may be not awake yet, I think. Uh, in other forms of the faith, Mass. All right? So you know what I'm talking about. So we are referring to the last meal that is recorded for us that the Lord partook with his followers the night before he was crucified. I want us to take a look at several passages, even though they are closely almost repeating of each other. Matthew and Mark are very much alike, but we're going to look at them. So Matthew 26, if you turn there, please. This is another one of those subjects that has kept more people away, that has turned more people off, that has frustrated more people. I myself find what has been done in most teaching on the Lord's Supper, the worst travesty that could occur because it's something that every single person calling themselves a Christian should want to do. It's not a mandate per se. I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm going to qualify. But more people have been ill-conditioned or ill-taught somehow that they must qualify for this. So let's take a look at this right now. Um, really, if you kind of start reading in Matthew 26, I want to show you a little bit of something. If you start in verse 17, it is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And interestingly, if you keep reading, it goes on to tell you it was the, the Passover was now. So it's funny that in just several verses, we have a time lapse that if you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't know occurred, right? Uh, first day of the feast, and then we have them partaking. So, now the first day of the, of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city, such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover. Now when even was come, he sat down with the twelve, did eat, and said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is uh, written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto them, Thou hast said. Now you've got the actual partaking, if you will. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, break it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So kind of bird's eye view, you get a, an idea of what's happening here. Now, I'm going to ask a few questions. Some of them are rhetorical, but just follow along with me because I'm going to make some very important points. So at this point, did all of his followers who were sharing this meal go 
or try to confess their sins. That's number one. That, see, I'm sorry, if you're not going to think about how you approach this and you just want to be a dummy, go somewhere else. Because this is what bothers me. Most will take the fact that Judas said, is it I? But they all said, is it I? As somewhat of a confession. Now, hear me out. Long after this event occurs, the Apostle Paul will write Romans 3.23 and tell us in no uncertain terms that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means all of those sitting around that table. If Christ said, it is now time for you to confess, they would have all had something to say. Maybe for one, it's, I pushed a duck in a puddle. Maybe for another, it was, I'll risk one eye. Okay? Who knows? But they would have all had something to confess. So you cannot make this exchange anything more than the fact that Jesus, as all-knowing, we'll call it, not just he's not just king, master, lord, but also prophet, is able to see and know. He knows the future. He knows that this one, this is the one who will betray him. But let me add to this. So if we put confession as a prerequisite to partaking, because in many churches that's what happens. You cannot take communion, go to the table of the Lord, anything without two acts. Primarily within the Catholic Church, you must be confirmed, and you must have also partaken. Um, they, they, they have seven sacraments. Uh, but to qualify for this act, it's almost like jumping through hoops. You must qualify. You must, there are certain criteria. I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing it. Furthermore, people get this a little bit confused. Remember, they were sitting down. They went to prepare the Passover meal. So there are two things we, we never talk about. But I'd just like to say them here to remove some of the confusion. Passover would have been celebrated in the exact manner that was celebrated of old which means they would have set the table with certain food and certain things that would have been done. But here's the difference. Passover in a typical setting, the story of the Exodus is read in what's called a Passover Haggadah. It's a little book, pamphlet that you'd have at Passover. They didn't need that. They had the word sitting at the table, and he didn't come to deliver the children out of Israel. He came to deliver the children of God out of sin's bondage. So when you start looking at this, you need to be very careful. There are too many people who don't understand that they had to have. It says right there that they made ready for the, the Passover. The Passover is, in its entirety, if you will, in terms of celebration, is like a communal meal with special food that's presented. And that tradition, if you want to call it that, has not changed. So they would have done that, and then we've got this event with bread, the bread and the cup. Um, so it, I'm kind of trying to lay this out to make it something more straightforward. So I said to you, Mark has uh, perhaps the same record because we know that there may have been borrowing between, all right, or be, from one to the other. But if you look at John's gospel, this is very interesting. If you look at John's gospel, let's go to John. Starting at chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world and, and continue, okay? So John 13 through about John 17, which is Christ's high priestly prayer, until they go out from wherever this is being recorded, people say, well, we don't know what happened during that meal. I believe that this is, should be superimposed over that meal because this, these events are right within that time frame. So if you keep reading, you see there is not one from through 13, chapter 13 through 17. There is not one mention whatsoever. If you just comb what's here, there isn't anything that says that, imagine, we're trying to fill in the blanks of what was said. If you take Matthew and Mark as the template that they, were, they 
broke bread, Jesus broke the bread, he blessed it, the cup, he blessed it, passed it around, it's a meal. But we don't have the conversation. Take John 13 through 17 and kind of say, it happened somewhere in there, stuff that in there somewhere. There is no mention for you or I or the disciples that they must confess, that they must be confirmed. This whole idea of being confirmed in the faith, see, to me, that can only be man's doctrine. And when I say man, please, I'm not sexist, so humankind. That can only be a man-made thing. How are we able to confirm someone in the faith? No one knows what's in your heart. No one knows what's going on. You can be catechized, so that means you can just repeat, wrote whatever prayers you're taught. That does not mean that Christ is living in you. And this whole idea somehow that we can check the box that you've passed this test and therefore you qualify is actually insanity. Now let me show you what I mean by this. Because people would like to take the passage I quoted out of Matthew and say, you see, Judas actually confessed. Well, let me take this to a, a greater degree of thinking. Because after this meal happened, what does Peter go and do? He denies the Lord three times. Anybody ever heard of that? That's what I'm talking about. So if, if anybody wants to say that that act and that exchange that is recorded in Matthew 26 is some type of confirmation that now they're accepted in the followings of Christ and they'll sin no more, whatever the gobbledygook that's peddled, it's just, it's not a thinking approach because we see Peter goes out, denies the Lord, is very sorrowful over it. So it, again, you can't make this about Judas and somehow this demonstrates that Judas said, is it me? They were all saying that and it also can't make you think that somehow that table established that these people would never deviate from the faith because of Peter's example. So let's stop there for a second. Now, if you really want to take this to another level, and you'll see eventually this will become clear of why I'm doing this. Turn, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that when ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So remember I said to you, Corinthians is a corrective letter to a church gone off the rails. He's not saying, oh, you guys are so amazing. You know, in, in this day and age, you come into a room, you tell everybody, you're great. You're so amazing. And then you kind of somehow find a way to tell somebody something without really telling them anything so that they're not offended. He wasn't he didn't pulling punches. So when they were reading this, some of them probably had to think, wow, that's rich of him or that's nice, but he just was going to put it out there. He says, uh, you don't always come. To, it's not always for the better when you all get together here. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now, what's interesting is that you're going to see this word coming up in the next verse. For there must also be heresies among you, sects, divisions, false teachings. You can add to this because the Greek word, we get our word for heresy directly from the Greek, heresy. So there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when you're come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. Now, what he's referring to, the background to this is before they would have what we're calling communion or table of the Lord, they would have a common meal together. Most it would be each person would bring their own food. Some people who were richer would eat sumptuously in front of beggars who might be res resorted to eating fruits and bugs. Who knows? So there was first a communal meal, and then there was the partaking of what we're calling the communion or the table of the Lord. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So they took the gathering of people and turned it into a party. He says, basically, one is hungry, another one is drunk, and that tells you these people were gathering for 
wrong reasons. And not with brotherly love either, by the way. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So before they even get to the table, you've got people who are not even engaging in empathy or sympathy for their fellow brother sitting, some has nothing to eat, or some has, we'll say, some had nothing to drink, but those that did consumed it all. They had no thought of... So think of the words of Christ when he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. Tell me that that looks like anything about what Christ said, and I'll tell you, you're a lunatic. This was every man for himself, and then some. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So I started out by saying, we don't have a commandment per se to come to the table, but when we do, it should be looked at as something that was strongly urged. In fact, the language here is more imperative, which if anybody's going to walk around talking about the sacraments of the church, which to me is, that's a story for another day, probably the things that I would, I would, ref I would refrain from using that word sacrament, and I would replace it with the Lord's wishes or the Lord's desire for us. Because, you know, sacraments carries all kinds of connotations depending on where you stand in life. So, this do ye in remembrance of me. So we're told the reason and the purpose. We'll, we'll hear about the manner of partaking. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And it goes on. So let me stop right there. So the first thing we can know, remember, I'm going to tap on something back in another message. We just went through the set times. I talked to you, and we opened up the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Passover. So if you forget that teaching, I'd highly recommend you go back and listen to it again, because... This is all tied into an understanding of what Christ did. When the statement, this is my blood of the new covenant, is like saying there was an old covenant. My, by my blood, no longer the blood of bulls and goats, as the writer of Hebrews said, but by my blood, the covenant is ratified in this new way. It's all going to go through me now. There is no performance of ceremonies. There is no ritualistic behavior. It's all going to flow, Christ speaking, through me because of the blood that will be shed. This is the, the, the way every covenant in the Bible, almost every covenant has been sealed with blood. So it's important to understand when you're reading this, the emphasis again when he says, even Paul writing this, talking about the night which the Lord was uh, betrayed. Well, you go back and you read, and we know that was a set time. We're looking at between unleavened bread, the mention in verse 17 that we looked at, to the Passover. So he is the fulfillment, and it's important to not lose sight of that, because that brings me to the next thing. Do you read anywhere the description of the bread? You don't. Now, there are things we assume, and we can absolutely, with absolute authority, assume them. That when Jesus and his disciples were gathered, they were using unleavened bread because it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. Simply put, there was no leaven. To have, to have any leaven would be breaking the feast. So there was no leavened bread. But 
what is disturbing is that people then go on to talk about how or what manner. I know that you're going to going to say, "Wow, you're really getting into the weeds of this." But should it be leavened bread, unleavened bread? Should it be what, what should it be? Should it be round? Should it be square? Well, let's start with the first thing. There was never such a thing as wafers. Pretty hard. If any of you have ever touched, I was going to say it, but if you've ever touched a piece of matzah, you know what that's like. You ever tried to break matzah? They break one square and it flies everywhere. Okay, you can't have a perfect circle. Sorry. That perfect circle that the Roman Catholics like to use is straight out of heathen pagan practices and has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry if you're hung up on that, and I'm going to say it. If you're offended by anything that I'm saying today, you need a reality check because that means you're offended by traditions that you have taken as from God, and the Bible says you have made void the word of God by your traditions, traditions of men. It's plainly there. So when you're, if somebody's genuinely searching for real answers, you have to start with being not just willing to look in this book, but honest with yourself that you may have been told, taught, instructed erroneously. I know what that is because I was for a good chunk of the beginning of my life, I thought all, everything, every dogma and every doctrine that I had heard, well, that has to be true. And you don't see a Bible, so it's got to be from God, right? But see, even the best man or woman is still fallible and will come up with stupid ideas that you and I can never live up to. And there are purposes behind all of these. You know, you can say practical purposes, but let me get back to the bread first. So first of all, there is nowhere in the book anywhere that says you must go to the table and it must be unleavened bread. That was the night Christ and his disciples were celebrating. If you're going to do it in the memorial and you're going to be a legalist, yeah, use unleavened bread. But if you don't have unleavened bread, use whatever you have. You can eat it. With, you can take communion with a cookie or a cracker. You know, it's the people who get into this legalism and they're, they're legalist for a reason, which I'm about to point out. So, uh, remember, you cannot separate this act of the table without recognizing, A, the attachment to Christ and, and his fulfillment of the set times. And the next thing is, we talk about the cup. They used wine. When they talk about, you know, they pass the cup, or when you take the cup of blessing in some places called the cup, uh, Okay, I have to be really careful when I say this. There are folks that deliberately do not drink alcohol, and I have complete respect for you, but please don't do what I think it's the Mormon church has done. The Mormon church said that Jesus told them to not drink wine. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. I don't know where, what, I'm sorry, find it because I'm scratching my head thinking, it's not in here. I'm looking for what's in here. You know, if you want to go find the golden plate somewhere, knock yourself out, okay? But it's not in here. That's my concern. What is in this book? This is the roadmap for us as believers. Okay, so the do part, when he says, this do ye, as I said, that is a form that we can say is like imperative. Not really like, hey, if you feel like doing it, but when you do this, you do it like this. You do it for this reason. So we're remembering the Lord's death till he comes back. And each time we are partaking, we're actually proclaiming his resurrection and return as well as his finished work. If you start to really kind of dig a little bit deeper as to what we're doing at the table. The instructions given by the Apostle Paul are that we are to examine ourselves, but it's not examine ourselves for anything other than, he says it elsewhere, if we're in the faith, if we're looking towards what we're doing, not being distracted, um, not taking it as something that we're going to pervert, twist, or caricature. So he also says that he that eateth and drinketh, and he uses the word unworthily. Now, some of you old timers have seen this, but there's a lot of folks out there that have not. So what we have here, 
um, I'll show you on this. You've got the whole Greek text written out morphologically tagged. That means that each and every word from the Greek, its function within the structure. When I say morphologically tagged, I'm telling you it's a verb, it's a noun, it's a pronoun. So the big one here is this word unworthily. Now I want you to take a good look at this. I'm going to actually bend down here so I can be at eye level with this. So I want you to take a look at this. This is clearly, I don't care what book you want to look in, what lexicon, what dictionary, this is an adverb. And what we have are a lot of versions, the English Standard Version, the NIV, the NASB, all of these translate unworthy, not unworthily. Now, unworthy, I want you to, it's just very subtle, take a look at one letter changes. Now, that's not a W, okay, but look at that, and then look at that. One is an adjective, one is an adjective, and one is an adverb. The reason why this is problematic, and even, by the way, the Dewey Reims, which was designed to be the Catholic version, became the Catholic Bible, also reads unworthily. So let me explain something which is common knowledge for most here, but not for all. An adverb modifies a verb. An adjective modifies a noun. That's basic grammar. So if you make something an adjective in the structure of the sentence, which it cannot be, it cannot be because anyone who knows Greek grammar is going to look at this ending right here. This ending will tell you that that is an adverb. The adverb is modifying the act of partaking and not the actor. So when you put an adjective, the adjective will modify the actor, telling us something about how or what. So why does this matter? There are seven types of adverbs. Adverbs of manner, which I tried to give you examples very fast, quickly, mostly. Adverbs of place, adverbs of time, adverbs of frequency, purpose, degree, conjunctive adverbs, that sounds like an eye disease, focusing <laughs> adverbs. So seven types, they all function differently, but an adverb in Greek functions exactly the way an adverb in English does. So think of it this way, for people who don't know grammar, verb, action, right, activity, something moving, adverb, adding to the verb, explaining and modifying the verb. So this, um, we give an example, like he ran quickly, right? And for us in English, it's something that ends with L-Y, typically, typically. So quickly is modifying he ran. But there are ways to parse this and really see it can only modify the manner of partaking and not the person. So when you go into a church, and I unfortunately have been in a few services where the words tossed around worthy or unworthy, and what they're saying is they're talking about you. Well, here's the problem. No one is worthy. We're made worthy by the blood of the Lamb, but there's no one worthy. So if you're using that translation, what you are doing is you're setting yourself up for the understanding that it's something about you your performance and not the act that is being modified. The act being modified says in a way or in a manner. So this particular adverb would be an adverb of manner, the method or manner of partaking, not, and again, people get this confused maybe, an adverb doesn't have, like a verb has, you can have person, masculine, feminine, singular, neutral, you could have different this is an adverb. That's all it is. It's plain and simple. So if somebody is reading this and understands what this means, now to, to the average person out there who's not a grammarian, they say, what's the big deal? They all sound the same, but they mean different things, and they affect, I'm sorry to say it this way, but it affects your understanding of grace, the grace that has been provided for you, because using the word unworthily, suggestive of the manner of partaking, that is, you're not discerning the Lord's body, 
but not on the actor himself versus unworthy, which is, it's all on me. And there is nothing in this Christian universe that we're dealing with that could be worse in understanding than that. Because everything that happened, Christ did. I'm just the lucky, blessed recipient to partake, sinner being saved by grace. So the understanding of these words, you might say, well, well, adverb, adjective, what does it make a difference? Well, it makes a big difference. I have listened to people preach messages before they go to the table. And what they've basically done without even maybe realizing it, maybe they do, maybe they don't, is they have preached condemnation. They've preached a message which no one can actually stand under because we are all unworthy. We're made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. So to even have this conversation, if you don't understand the basic grammar, I, I don't know what to tell you except that it does change the perspective and understanding. It forces a person to, instead of I'm looking at me, I'm looking towards what Christ did. And the only thing that Paul is concerned with here, and he's making plain, remember, in light of what I just said, these people came, and their manner of partaking together was just a train wreck. So he's saying the method or manner. Now, this becomes important when you start looking at the various ways this has been interpreted. So I'm going to start with Catholic interpretation and work my way through interpretations to show you really why this is so bad. Since the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, between 1215 and the Council of Trent in 1551, it was determined that only the priest could administer the cup and the bread. This is another problem. Now you might say to me, well, where does it say it and where does it not say it? Well, the only place that we see it, hear me out. As often as ye drink, as often as ye eat, it doesn't say anything about who's dispensing. So you could say, well, Christ was the one, but we're, we're not Christ. We're Christians, we're a little Christ, but we're not Christ. And if you remember last week, I started telling that as the message started spreading out of Jerusalem, one of the first subjects that began to basically be incorporated was the teaching on communion. So how do you get to this corner that it can only be administered by the priest? Well, that goes back to the idea that the priest, only the priest can bless the bread and the cup because the belief is that the sacraments transform the, the theological term is transubstantiation, that these transform from what we call emblems, just something you're looking at. It's really just bread still, and it's really just wine, but it helps us to focus. They say changes into the real presence of Christ. So somehow, in the act of hocus pocus, uh, you go from taking a little bit of wine, a little bit of bread, to something magic happens there to these elements, as you're, and you're physically and truly really eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, again, can't find it anywhere. The verbiage, this is the problem. The verbiage in which much of this is said is really important. If you taste, if you, I'm sorry, if you read the scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Who has ever tasted the Lord? It's an expression. It has meaning and it has actually Semitic meaning, because that's in the Psalms. But you cannot take verbiage as we understand it and then just completely translate it equal for equal. It does not work that way. So when he's saying, take, eat, this, is, this represents the act that I'm about to do for you. This blood, this cup represents the sealing, the ratification of a new covenant, but you are drinking wine, grapefruit juice, water, it will still remain that in the cup. But this teaching, the reason why I bring this up, this doctrine of transubstantiation, will become a huge part. Remember how I started? I really wanted to teach him a message on Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. OK. So who, of course, as you know, protested. And we get our word Protestant from the Diet of Spire, which was by him. But there is much to say about Martin Luther's understanding about the table of the Lord and transubstantiation. So I, I want to park that for a minute. But much of what is taught 
and instructed and peddled upon people is unscriptural and unfounded. It is, number one, first and foremost, the way to control people. Only the clergy can do this. I'm sorry, this act, as oft as you do this, there is no mention of this being a high liturgical, elevated to some, okay, now we can partake because I'm, I, it sounded holy. It was designed to be an act that you could do in your home, with your family, by yourself, corporately as a body when we come together. But there is, I'm sorry, there is nowhere where you're going to read what this has become. Let me read you a quote. And we know that sometimes this is also called the Eucharist. You, in Greek, EU, you, good, and charis from charisto, which is thanks, good thanks or thanksgiving. The Holy Eucharist is the most important of the seven sacraments of the church, and this, and in no other sacrament, we receive the very body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Stop right there. So if I wanted to really take that and go with it, it means that every time I go to the table of the Lord, I got a little bit more of Christ in me, then I'd be a lush. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. It just, you know, think about some of these things, and it makes no sense. By the way, let me go back to doctrine, doctrine from our Lord. He said, I must go away that the Holy Spirit or the Comforter must come. He will guide you. He will show you in all things. In other words, bring to remembrance even Scripture. So when they say we receive, we receive Christ through the prevenient grace that comes by way of the Father through the Holy Spirit, and I'm sorry, it's not in the sacraments. This is a commemorative act. Do this in remembrance of me. It is a commemorative act of what he did. It also should remind us of his complete work. And I'm not done with this. So the idea that all of Christ is present, body, blood, soul, divinity, under the appearances of bread and wine. This is what is meant when the term, if you ever hear the term real presence, that's what's meant. So... Here's the problem. The risen Christ, we say, where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst. He is with us in every sense, if you will, by way of the Holy Spirit, third part of the Godhead. So when we try to make this like we're separating now with the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ, it's like saying, Christ does all this, but there's no other work that's being done. The whole thing is just an error. It's completely wrong. Then from the Catholic Catechism, Part 2, Section 2, Chapter 1, Article 3. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Quote, those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured to Christ by confirmation can participate in the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by, the way, by way of the Eucharist. So immediately in their articles, there is a criteria that must be met in order for someone to partake. They must be confirmed. They must be baptized. Stop right there. So if you get into this being overly dogmatic about stuff, you're going to completely lose the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is this. Jesus is being crucified. You've got one thief here and one thief there. The one that looks at him, recognizes who he is, and he turns to him and says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Was he baptized? Don't think so. Did he take communion? Don't think so. Was he confirmed? Don't think so. And yet Jesus says to this, this stranger with no ceremony, no sacrament, this day you'll be with me in paradise. That has to tell you that above all, I'm not saying one shouldn't get baptized or one shouldn't go to the table, but above all, what was important for the Lord? To recognize who he was, faith in his person, King of kings, Lord of lords, Messiah, okay? So anything else is just kind of just a bunch of blah, blah, blah. So immediately they put a criteria. And if I was going to say, look, I wouldn't want somebody coming to the table of the Lord if I didn't teach them. Not criteria. I want them to understand so that they can go to the table and fully partake and it become a blessing to them. We go to the table of the Lord. Sometimes we go 
when we're sick. Sometimes we approach the table because we know, look at the, ministry, look at the complete ministry of Jesus. He did many miracles. He healed people. He gave a promise to us of eternal life, of his return. Think of all of that. You go to the table, and you don't go to the table and think, gosh, I really hope that what Jesus did is real or it's true. No, we, we stand on that act. Say he healed somebody. We stand on that act that he did that. We go to the table, and we look to the words of Isaiah with his stripes we were healed. We look to those words that were prophesied in the past of him, the fulfillment that had the capacity and the power to heal. Now, Jesus still has the capacity and power to heal. You might say, well, how come some people get healed and some people don't? I'm not God, I can't answer you that question. I can only say this. God is not a genie in a bottle. Just because you have an itch, it doesn't mean God's gonna come scratching. It means you go to him, you humble yourself, you go to him with full faith, you go and you, you, you present yourself at the table, recognizing that that complete work, healing, salvation, everything that, everything that we read about in this book, we can basically partake by faith through these emblems when we go to the table. The cup is not changing into blood. Trust me. Every time I take communion here, I get heartburn. I don't think blood gives you heartburn. And periodically, I do choke on the little crumbs of cracker. Doesn't taste much like flesh. I'm trying to make a point and be ridiculous about it. One more thing. Section 1343 of their dogmas and statutes, or whatever you want to call them, it was above all on the first day of the week, Sunday, that the day of Jesus' resurrection that Christians met to break bread. And, and let me pause right there, because this is another thing. We can only do it on this set day. Well, let's be real, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this right now. You want to talk about Sunday, you've got to start on Saturday night, because that's the way they reckon time. And we know you can talk about whatever you want till you turn blue in the face. We know that he came out of the tomb after the Sabbath was over on Saturday night, which technically from Saturday night to Sunday morning sunup, you could make the argument he came out of the grave Saturday night, which he did. We are not given a time to partake, yet this has been dogmatized. Now there are now midweek masses, but it's been dogmatized as such, so we're, you only, you're only allowed to do it on Sunday, and that's that. But wait, I started there because I want to show you something that comes out of the Anglican Church. In the 39 Articles of Religion, section 25 and onward, but specifically Article 28, quote, insomuch that, in so much that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ, transubstantiation, the change of the substance of the bread and wine in the Supper of the Lord, this is in their writing, cannot be proved by holy writ. So at least they're honest enough to put that in there. Can't be proved because it's not doctrine. What about the Orthodox Church? Christian Eucharist is connected to the Passover meal in the Old Testament. This is there from their writing. At the end of his life, Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples, the original celebration of a commemorative of the deliverance of the children of Israel. The Passover meal was transformed by Christ as an act done in remembrance of him, his life, death, resurrection, and as the new and eternal Passover lamb who frees men from all slavery of evil, ignorance, and death and transfers them into everlasting life and the kingdom of God. I'll take that. That's kind of a general presentation has no weird stuff in it. It's enough uh, biblically direct for it to, to fly. Presbyterian. Communion is also called the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, from the Greek for Thanksgiving. It's a time to renew faith and strengthen participants for duties and privilege of Christian service. Okay, let me go back to our text for a minute. Did I not say that the manner of partaking is do not partake unworthily, right? That's the manner and method. This has nothing to do with preparing persons for privileges and duties for service. 
This is a complete focus on the work of Christ. Anything less than that, you are basically dissing the Lord. So Presbyterian might not have it so right. In this act, the bread and wine represent the sacrificial body and blood of Christ and recall the last meal shared with his closest followers. Together they symbolize the new covenant between God and his people through the presence of the Holy Spirit. The elements enable us to give thanks, remember, and participate God's redemptive work on a behalf. Okay, Jehovah's Witness. They simply say that's actually really, believe it or not, surprisingly good, okay? They say that the cup and the bread are emblems, just like we say here. They're emblems. They, they help us to look through to focus on the work of Christ. So I like that. Uh, they are not miraculously changed into or mixed with his literal flesh and blood. So I like that. It's surprising. I thought it was going to be something out there. It's not, but it's the Mormons. The Mormons take first, first place here. Mormons profess that only they have the priesthood authority necessary to administer the sacrament with validity. So you mean to tell me if I want to take communion, I got to go to an LDS church? <laughs> got a problem with that. You know why? Because this is the same church that decided for, since its, its inception, they decided in 1978 to let black people in. Do you not know that? Yeah, black people could not get into the Mormon church until 1978, until they decided, no, they should come in. So if you're going to go down that pathway, you might want to look at the history of when somebody says, the Lord told us not to use wine but water, you might want to rethink where you're at. But the simple fact here is what we're doing after everything's said and done and why explaining just even one word out of the Greek matters. You have a lot of people who, when the table of the Lord is mentioned, the Lord's Supper, communion, you know what they do? Oh, I'm good. I don't want to partake. Or they think somehow that's, that's for people who have something better. Or they're more spiritual or whatever. This is, listen to me. I don't care how nice of a person you are, how great you are, how amazing or how bad you are. We are all sinners, all of us, every single day. Not, I'm not talking about 20 years, 10 years, 5 years. I'm talking about we sin daily. And we are sinners being saved by grace every single day. So can you imagine being somewhere in a church where you basically are meant or you, you are being told that you can't come because you either don't qualify, you're not good enough, you're not spirit. Trust me, this happens all over the place. Peddling condemnation, peddling guilt. This is rampant, and this is why most people say, oh, I, I'm, I'm good, I'm okay, I don't want to do it. But what if I said to you that we have enough distractions every single day almost, I would say for me in my universe, it's hourly. That being able to just put a time, whatever that is, we play communion several times a day on the network. For you to have your, whatever you're going to partake with, bread or water, wine, whatever it is, tucked away in a corner at the base of your computer, wherever you're listening. And to be able to just stop in your tracks, and it's like somebody saying, hey, like, wake up. I'm giving you a reminder. That act of sitting down and isolating, most communions are never longer on the network, usually. An average communion is probably about, what, 20 minutes? 20 minutes? 20 minutes of your time to recalibrate and focus. That's, you know, that's pretty clever. I mean, maybe it's not for the same reason that I said earlier. You go for all these different reasons. But for most of us who are so distracted and easily distracted, saying, I know what time the communion's going to play at because they're at predictable times. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make it part of my, whether it's daily, whether it's every other day or at least weekly, but it's part of your, we'll call it your habit. And by that I mean to develop putting aside time to just sit and remember and think of, when you start thinking of this, a lot of other things will fade to the background. They become like, who cares? What does it matter? So I would say to you, what a brilliant thing. But on, on that, I have more to say. What I want to tell you, though, is that it disturbs me that many churches have this box-checking mentality. You go back and read afresh 
Matthew and Mark, Luke records it too, but in a different way, of this Passover Last Supper meal. And read it with the eyes that say, I'm following Jesus, I'm following the teachings of the disciples, I'm following what the Bible says. There are no regulations here. There are no restrictions. There is no idea somehow that you are some Pavlov's dog that has to jump through a hoop to be able to qualify for something that should have been done freely as part of our faith as an act, a commemorative memorial act that also is a proclamation both of his life, of his death, his resurrection, and his return. Can you imagine that? In one single act, you're doing all of that. And your needs are being met when you go for some of us. Some of us are sick. We go to the table. We partake by faith, looking to these elements for healing. And some people will just keep going and keep going, like the importunate woman who kept knocking, keep going until the Lord heals them. And have I seen, I'm, I, at least I'm honest with this, have I seen people that have not been healed and it's 20 years and they're just, they keep knocking? Yes, I have. And I can't tell you anything except that I believe the Lord, only the Lord knows why. I don't know why, that person doesn't know why, but I'll tell you one thing, those folks who might say, well, how could you say this? But I'm going to say it anyway. They have a really great blessing in their life. Do you know why? Their daily focus. No, when you have a pain and it hurts every day, I have one back here all the time. And no, it's not the colloquial, it's for real, okay? <laughs> have it every day. It's perpetual, it's chronic. And I've always said, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe it could be healed, that's for sure. I'm going to keep asking. But also maybe the Lord has let me have that because that's my reminder every time I walk, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is with me. The Lord's my healer, and if he doesn't heal me in the now, he has promised that with my last breath, I will be completely healed. So it's a win-win, but you've got you've to get there first. You've got to be exercising faith first, and you've got to recognize that a lot of the stuff that is peddled in the church in the name of Jesus Christ is nothing but to keep you in your place, much like the government, to keep you in your place like chattel here, will tell you what you can do and when you can do it, but there is no instruction for that except that you are discerning what you do when you do it in the manner that you do it. Uh, Paul makes it very plain. This section is like the explanation. And if you're reading 1 Corinthians 11, read it with the mindset that they were doing everything but what they were supposed to do at the table. This is why he gives the instructions with clarification. So... How should we, or what should we take away from all this? We're going to see two things, three things maybe. One, it is an individual act. It is an act done by faith. Here's the other one. Because you remember I quoted from the Catholic records, and they're saying that only a priest can. Well, tell me what you do with the scripture that says, you are a royal priesthood, living in lively stones, First Peter. Tell me what you do with that when it says, for anyone who walks with the Lord is a priest in their own home. And if you're a priest in your, home, in your own home, that doesn't mean you just, I'm a priest and I go home and I don't know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing here, by the way, that, that, that is for the person in the home who would be able to kind of be what Christ is to the church. You are in your home. I'm sorry. The Catholic Church would not want you to have that, probably. I don't know about the Anglican Church, but certainly the Catholic Church, because it is required for you to speak to a priest. It is required for you. He is the intercessor. He's the intermediary. There is no going to Jesus. There is no direct contact. So when you think about it, it's kind of sad. The cup, symbolizing his blood, given to us in concept to say, this sealed the covenant. We're not slaughtering animals anymore. That dispensation is finished, but the blood that was shed. God so loved Melissa Scott, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and not perish. It's time for the church to wake up and say, we are to be fathers, living, breathing, 
taking in this word and how can you take in this word when people have been told stay away get back you're not allowed here I don't I'm sorry I don't want to stand up be in line like some there to stand up to let somebody's hands put a piece of bread in my mouth I'm sorry but you know, that may work in nature with birds and their babies but it doesn't work for me okay not especially when I'm told as often as you do this act not as often as as someone does it to you, but as often as you do it. Do it this way. Do it by faith. Do it remembering everything that the Lord did. And last but not least, and I think this probably will kill the point ad nauseum, what would be the point if we could tell everyone, you can come to the table as long as you understand what you're doing. That's, in a nutshell, that's the easiest way. The manner in what you're doing and what you're doing. Come because it will draw you closer to Christ. Come to the table because you may receive healing. Come to the table because you might better understand your salvation. Come to the table to give thanks. Come to the table to appreciate. Come to the table with every certain part of what I've just said without guilt, without shame, without restriction, without somebody telling you, you don't qualify, you haven't been confirmed, you haven't jumped through the hoops, or that somehow by coming to the table, that is not an act of salvation. So what I'm saying to you is, if we are to look at the act, it's really by the grace of God that he said, in many ways, just like we're able to participate in the Lord's work by financially supporting your tithes and offerings, this is another way of almost being involved in the fact that I can partake. I don't have to go through this in a line. I don't have to go through this in a church. I can be in my own home sitting at my own kitchen table or by my bedside. I could be laying in bed sick. I could be standing up any way, shape, or form as long as when I take the cup and the bread, I'm looking at these and I'm thinking to myself, this represents the body that the Lord laid upon that body the night or the day he was crucified. Every disease and every sin, all manner of everything laid upon him and the blood that was poured out seals the deal for me that I am made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. That's why using the word worthy for this is it's a, it's a tragedy that anyone would ever even use that, unworthy, because we're all unworthy, but we're made worthy, not in any act we do, but by the blood of the Lamb. Hopefully, for a lot of folks listening to me, yeah, some of you are going to be mad, some of you are going to be angry, and some of you are going to be like, oh, I, don't, I don't want to hear this woman anymore talk, but I'm going to tell you something. Check out what I'm saying, study up, look at what I'm saying. If you read Greek, please read the Greek. It'll clarify and wipe away the idea somehow that you're a second-class citizen in the church. We are all sinners. We've all been washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, so why wouldn't you want to come, enjoy, and give thanks at the table of the Lord? Hopefully, I've helped somebody. I pray so. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.